You're listening to the Economics and Country Risk Podcast from S&P Global Market Intelligence. In each episode, our experts will provide you with the where, how, and when to make decisions that transform your business. I'm Sarah Johnson, Executive Director of Global Economics with S&P Global Market Intelligence. The agenda is the global economy, recessions averted or delayed. And I'm joined by my colleagues, Joel Pracken, our chief U.S. economist, Diego Iscaro, head of European economics, Todd Lee, chief China economist, and Tia Fori, head of sub-Saharan Africa insights and analysis. At the global level, we see recession averted. The global economy started 2023 with a burst of energy. We have been revising upward our outlook for the year 2023 for about four or five months now. And indeed, this will be the case in March when I expect we'll show a 2.2% expansion in global GDP this year. We released our U.S. forecast yesterday and growth is up to 1% for the year. So although we might see some setbacks in Europe and North America in early 2023, the annual numbers will show positive growth. The risks of recessions are diminishing. And 2.2% is certainly solid growth, but it's below potential. A recession defined by the World Bank would be a decline in real per capita GDP, which would essentially be a growth rate under 1%. So we're solidly in expansion territory but still, it's a weaker performance than last year. And we are revising downward our 2024 and 2025 forecast by a shade. And this reflects more persistent inflation pressures with stronger growth. And notably in services, labor markets remain tight. We're seeing broadly based growth in employment, aside from a few notable layoffs in technology industries. And this is bringing upward pressure on wage rates and services prices. Supply conditions are improving, however, and we're likely to see goods inflation moderating. We're now about 12 months from the peak in commodity prices that occurred in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And that will put some downward pressure on intermediate and final goods prices. On the positive side, business confidence has been rising according to our PMI surveys. Businesses in many cases are looking forward to growth beyond the current slowdown, which is a positive sign eventually for capital formation. But in the meantime, to cool inflation, central banks have more work to do and we expect to see some further interest rate hikes in the United States and the Eurozone. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Joel Pracken for the outlook for the U.S. economy. Thanks, Sarah. It now seems increasingly likely that the U.S. economy will avoid an outright recession in the first half of this year. That's the good news. The bad news is that a recession that is averted in the first half of this year probably only delays until later, a downturn that likely would be more severe because it would come in the wake of more aggressive monetary tightening than we're showing in our current base case. And the subplot here is that recent data on growth and inflation for the U.S. has surprised significantly to the upside, and it's really complicating the Fed's job. So let's think about the backdrop then. Labor markets here in the U.S. are unsustainably tight. In January, the unemployment rate fell to 3.4%. That's the lowest since May of 1969. But by itself, the unemployment rate doesn't fully reflect the current set of labor market conditions. And that's because job openings are unprecedentedly elevated relative to the labor force. Now, it's true that pressure on prices for certain commodities and core goods have eased as global growth has slowed and as supply chain kinks have been ironed out. But core inflation persists intolerably above 2%. And there are ongoing concerns over wages and particularly service sector prices and soaring shelter costs, which lag current rent contracts that are cooling 
by up to 18 months. All of this is a reminder that while inflation has peaked, and it has, there won't be a magical, immaculate disinflation all the way down to 2%. There won't be a, a painless disinflation. So the Fed is tightening monetary policy to weaken demand, but the U.S. economy is not fully cooperating with the Fed's efforts. In particular, despite the tightening financial conditions over 2022, recent data has compelled up revisions to our growth forecast for this year. And that makes it increasingly likely the U.S. will avert a full-on recession earlier this year. And that means there will be no imminent relief from the inflation pressures that are emanating from these tight labor markets. It also means that the Fed probably has more work to do to prevent inflation from becoming entrenched above its 2% objective. So just a reminder here that an economy that is stronger for longer likely only delays a recession that might come later but be more severe because it will be triggered by more aggressive monetary tightening than we're showing in our base case. Okay, and in these circumstances, I do have to worry about how bad things might be, how high the unemployment rate might have to go in order to contain inflation. Faster growth over the course of 2023 means a slower rise in the unemployment rate. We're now projecting the unemployment rate to reach a peak of about 4.5% more than a year later than we were projecting last month when our forecast for GDP growth in 2022 was a bit lower. I want to say a word about, you know, in my worry closet is a folder that's just entitled, How Bad Could This Get? And hints from how bad it could eventually get are taken from the recent shift in the so-called beverage curve. And the implication of that shift is that labor market conditions are tighter at any given unemployment rate today than they were before the pandemic. And the implication of that is that we cannot expect to return to a pre-pandemic estimate of what was considered to be full employment then in the low fours and expect to experience the same kind of labor market conditions today that we experienced back then when the unemployment rate was four and a quarter. No, the shift in the beverage curve suggests that if that shift persists, it will take a rise in the unemployment rate all the way to 6% to give us the same kind of labor market conditions today that previously we would have associated with a much lower unemployment rate. So what would it take for the unemployment rate to rise to 6% in an economy that has potential growth rate of say two and a current unemployment rate of approximately three and a half. Well, doing some simple kind of calculations, I guesstimated that one way we could get to a 6% unemployment rate would be to have a 4% decline peak to trough in GDP over a period of one year. That would be a pretty significant recession. Another way to get to a 6% unemployment rate from where we are would be to have zero growth over three years. So a protracted growth recession. Now, I'm not suggesting that either one of those is what we're gonna have. I'd say those are the upside risks that we're thinking about here, but there's a significant enough probability attached to those kinds of risks that I think it would be wise for our customers to be thinking about those possible outcomes when planning their business strategies going forward. Our next speaker is Diego Scaro on Europe. I'll go through the outlook for the European economy focusing on the Eurozone and have two objectives today. The first one is to put the latest data in perspective, data has been better than expected. And the second one is to explain why, although we don't have a technical recession on the, on the baseline, we expect growth to remain modest this year. And for that, I'll pay particular attention to the outlook for the labor market, inflation and monetary policy. Now, the outlook for the European economy has outperformed expectations. That's clear. And relatively mild weather played a key role in limiting the demand for energy. But it's fair that to say that Europe moved quite fast to avoid the worst case scenario. For example, uh, signing contracts to replace Russian gas with LNG. I can remember where I read that Europe is generally bad at policy making, but pretty good at fighting crisis. And I think what we've seen this winter is a good example of that. Now, better than expected doesn't mean good. And the Eurozone growth rate, just 0.1% quarter on quarter, was marginal. It was the weakest in seven quarters. And data released in recent weeks suggest that it's likely to be revised downwards. Several member states saw their economies contract 
in Q4, and that includes some of the largest member states, such as Germany and Italy. The same can be said when we look at the industrial sector. Production was down only marginally during the fourth quarter, but there has been a large disparity between energy intensive sectors, such as the chemical sector, for example, which struggle as a result of very high energy costs, and sectors such as transportation that benefited from the easing of global supply chains. So the situation really varies significantly, not only across geographies, but also across different sectors. The signal from the latest survey data also paint an improving picture. For example, our composite PMI output index rose to an eight-month high in February, helped by improving conditions in the service sector. The economic indices sector published by the European Commission also rebounded from the lows in late 2022, and that includes consumer confidence, which had collapsed as a result of uh, rising inflation. So we think that this improvement needs to be taken with caution. It is possible that maybe, at least partially, the result of a correction of very high uncertainty levels uh, by the end of last year. And in general, the data still point to quite soft underlying conditions. But considering the latest figures, it is likely that while the estimate for the fourth quarter of last year may be revised downwards, a current forecast of a quarter-on-quarter -quarter contraction in activity during the first quarter of this year may be slightly pessimistic. Now, a positive aspect is that labour market conditions have remained quite solid. The unemployment rate in the Eurozone was stable at its all-time low of 6.7% in January. Employment growth surprised on the upside during the fourth quarter. And the quite elevated vacancy rates and quite a large number of firms reporting labour shortages, particularly in the service sector, suggest that labour market conditions remain quite tight. Now, labour markets are and will be key in sustaining household finances, not only through employment, but tight labour markets are also driving higher wage growth. Although well, wages are still rising by significantly less than inflation, and we expect real wages in the Eurozone to remain negative this year. The good news is that although there are some indications showing that employment growth may be losing some steam, and we actually project this slowdown to intensify as the year progresses, we think that the tightness of labour market conditions should limit the increase in unemployment we're going to see in 2023. And this is certainly positive for household finances, which are still struggling with very high inflation. But from the central bank's point of view, it also increases the risk of a price wage spiral, making inflation more difficult to bring back to the 2% target. And indeed, the news on inflation in the Eurozone hasn't been encouraging. Yes, the headline figure has come down quite substantially from a peak of almost 11% in October last year to 8.5% in February. But core inflation has actually gone the other way, reaching a new record high of 5.6% last month. Our alternative measure of inflation, such as the super core and trim inflation rates, which also reached a, a new record high in February, suggest that underlying inflation and pressures remain quite intense despite the easing of the headline inflation rate. The drivers of inflation in the Eurozone are almost a mirror image of what they were around six months ago. Uh, energy price inflation is falling quite rapidly, although it remains quite high, and around 20% of its level before the start of the conflict in Ukraine, where price of food, manufacturing goods, and services are all increasingly quite rapidly. The positive news is that base effects will continue to drive falls in energy prices, particularly from March onwards. And surveys measuring industrial firms' pricing intentions point to a moderation of manufacturing goods inflation this year. On the other hand, with wage growth picking up and firms 
restoring their profit margins following the pandemic. Inflation in the service sector will remain quite high and stick it to the downside. Now, this stickiness of underlying inflation is also bad news for the ECB and increases the likelihood of a tightening cycle going further and interest rates remaining higher than we had expected or we were expecting a few months ago. Now, the next policy meeting for the ECB will take place on, on the 16th of March. And the communication from the prior meeting in February effectively pre-announced a 50 basis point increase. We think this is the most likely outcome, although the, the latest inflation data opens the door to a 75 basis point move. And we're in the process of revising our projections to incorporate the recent inflation data, but also, as Joel mentioned, the prospect of a higher peak for US policy rates. We are likely to include a further 50 basis point increase in May, as we think the underlying inflation is unlikely to come down significantly by then. And we're also likely to incorporate another 25 basis point increase in June. By June, we expect core inflation to have peaked and the impact of higher rates on the economy to be more evident. And we think that this is likely to lead to a pause in the tightening cycle. Our provisional forecast implies the deposit rate peaking at 3.75%, up from the current 25 and the refinancial rate matching its uh, all-time high in 2008 of 4.25%. Now, higher policy rates affect activity with a lag. The full impact of the monetary policy is still to be felt. The latest bank lending survey shows a tightening of credit standards and a large fall in household demand for credit, particularly mortgages. And, and this is unsurprising, given the large increase in mortgage rates we've seen in recent months. For example, the average mortgage rate in Germany increased for just below 1% at the start of 2022 to around 3.5%. And the effect of high rates, it's not immediate. In many countries, most mortgages have a lengthy fixed period, but eventually higher borrowing costs will lead to lower asset prices, particularly house prices. And this can already be seen in the data, particularly in some of the Nordic economies, but also in the Eurozone in, in Germany and Finland. And in general, higher borrowing costs will put downward pressure on business investment, not only due to discouraging new projects, but also increasing the number of business failures, which again is all starting to be shown in the latest data. Now, all in all, our base case is for growth momentum to build gradually during 2023, 2024, but remain muted. As I mentioned earlier, in the very near term, growth may be a bit firmer than showed in our current projections, but it's also a risk that the more resilient activities in the short term, the more central banks will tighten monetary policy which could put growth under pressure, particularly in late 2023 and early 2024. So I'll hand it over to Dot, who will cover the outlook for mainland China. Thank you, Diego. For China, with the COVID outbreak waves that emerged after China exited from the COVID policy having subsided, there are now two key factors determining China's short-term economic outlook. One is economic normalization, how soon and how fast can economic activities normalize? And second factor is policy. How strong and how wide ranging will government's policy be to support economic recovery? Now, in terms of normalization, after the outbreak wave subsided, we've begun to see economic activities progressively improve. We can see this in the purchasing managers index data or the PMI data. And we also see this in tourism. In the uh, New Year holidays that span from December 31st to January 2nd, tourism was only marginally better than 2022 or a year ago level, both in terms of tourism volume and tourism revenue. And by the time China had the Lunar New Year holidays, which is three weeks later, tourism substantially improved from 2022. But activities are still not quite back to normal because if you look at both holidays, the levels are still substantially lower 
than the 2019 or pre-pandemic level. And the expectation and hope is that because there's a lot of pent-up demand during the pandemic as households have ramped up their savings during the pandemic, that the release of pent-up demand could really spur and help economic recovery. But if we look at household saving and borrowing behavior, deposit growth continued to remain very elevated. In January, it was still growing at around 17%. This is quite a lot higher than the end of 2021 level. Also, in terms of household borrowing in medium to long-term loans that help finance household major purchases, that has continued to decelerate. In the lead up to the so-called two sessions that's currently uh, taking place in China, in which the central government, they have announced the economic targets for this year. They just released a growth target for this year. GDP growth is around 5%. Regional governments actually were also doing work, you know, before the the two sessions, preparing their um, economic growth reports and setting economic targets for this year. And one of the targets they set, besides real GDP growth, is fixed asset investment. We were able to compile, out of the 31 regional governments, um, 25 economic work reports and 25 sets of targets. So for the fixed asset investment target, out of the 25 government reports we were able to compile, actually nine governments, nine regions actually set their fixed investment growth target less than the 2022 actual fixed investment growth. I mean, that's quite remarkable considering how challenging economic conditions were last year, given COVID. I think there are two reasons for this. One is that regional governments are under heavy financial strains because of the support that they have to provide for pandemic controls like repeated mass testing. So that limits their ability to help facilitate local state enterprise investment. And secondly, we think that the regional governments are pretty well in tune to local business sentiments and the sentiments for investment among private businesses is, is probably pretty weak right now. So I think they'd rather be conservative in setting these targets. Just moving on to have a quick word on the housing market. Housing market has been a key drag on economic growth in the last couple of years. But we're actually beginning to see some very early signs, some tips of green shoots of recovery. China MBS conducts a house price survey of China's 70 cities. And in January of the 70 cities, 36 of them actually show price increase. This is an increase from 15 cities in December. And we do a straight average across these 70 cities. The average price in January actually was unchanged from December. So this is the first time that this average home price did not suffer deflation or price drop since September 2021. actually had price drop for 16 consecutive months until January this year. In terms of policy, following the exit from COVID policy, the government has signaled that it will shift um, policy focus widely to support economic recovery. And there is policy space to ramp up stimulus, at least in the short term, given policy easing has been very measured since pandemic began. And the policy support will both support demand and supply. On the demand side, the government has indicated that they will support consumers' major purchases like automobiles and housing. And they will also provide financial support to boost investment with state-owned enterprises leading the investment drive. Also, they will continue to ramp up infrastructure investment. However, they are not providing major unemployment financial support for the laid-off workers. On the supply side, they will provide financial relief for private, small, and medium-sized enterprises. And that was also ease the regulatory crackdown that they imposed in 2021. And then for the housing market, they actually have begun to ease policy, but mostly on the demand side since late 2021. But now the government's indicating that they would ease policy on the supply side as well to provide financial support for the developers, at least for developers to help them complete the unfinished construction. And this is a key to the recovery of the housing market because this has been a major impediment in households' home price purchase decisions because 
of the financial troubles the developers were under, a lot of them couldn't finish the constructions that were already underway. So households viewing this as a risk that they would not want to you know, purchase new homes, given that there's a risk that the construction may not be completed. We think that this, house, this policy support is really important to help turn around the housing market downturn. And also, given the COVID policy has been removed and the economy could begin to normalize, stimulus policies will be much more effective under these conditions than under COVID policy. That's a very quick summary of China's short-term reopening recovery update. So let me hand the discussion to Tia to cover other emerging markets. Tia? Thank you very much, Todd. So for emerging markets, there are different forces that are shaping the outlook for 2023. On the one hand, we have a rebound or stronger growth in GDP expected for mainland China. And of course, this will be hugely beneficial for those economies which show strong economic interlinkages with mainland China. For instance, in sectors like tourism, like what Todd has spoken about just earlier on. We've also seen a rebound in global commodity prices after the lifting of the COVID-19 lockdown measures earlier in the year. Since then, global commodity prices has come down, but they are still at levels higher than what we've seen six months ago. And this, of course, also very beneficial for emerging markets. But at the other end, we have much higher interest rates expected for developed economies or the risk of that, and also very high interest rates for developed economies. The reason for that is the sticky high inflation that we are witnessing in emerging markets in many instances linked to very high retail food prices. So for a lot of emerging markets, such as South Africa, Indonesia, Egypt, Malaysia, as well as India, we find it highly unlikely that interest rates in emerging markets will come down during the course of 2023. We do expect interest rates in some Latin American countries to come down during the course of the year, particularly Brazil as, as well as Argentina. Although, again, the stickiness of inflation, particularly food inflation, is really pushing out the expectations of this lower interest rates. So you are seeing these different forces shaping the outlook for emerging markets next year. So overall, the rebound in or the stronger growth in mainland China expected for this year will push up overall emerging market growth prospects for 2023. So for now, we expect emerging market growth to average 3.7%. That's during our February forecast round, which is up from the 3.2% we expected four months ago in November. But despite this rebound in China, there's a mixed outlook for other emerging markets because there are other factors shaping the outlook in the near term. We are expecting slower GDP growth, as Sarah has mentioned, which of course will be a drag on economic activity for emerging markets, particularly for those ones who has the US and the Eurozone as major trading partners. But there's also other headwinds. We have seen quite a lot of pent up demand supporting private consumption expenditure for a lot of emerging markets during the course of 2022 after the lifting of COVID-19 lockdown measures. And these kind of tailwinds is really starting to fade and will be less visible during the course of 2022. For a lot of emerging markets, governments have much higher public sector debt levels, which of course has implications for their debt servicing costs and their fiscal space to provide additional support for this year. I should also mention there's a strong possibility of lifting some of those subsidies for food and fuel we've seen during 2022 due to this limited fiscal space. And this, of course, also feeding through to inflationary pressures or ongoing inflationary pressures for emerging markets. And now we spoke about the high interest rates, which will continue to be a drag on overall economic activity. So for some countries, um, despite the rebound or the stronger growth in Chinese GDP expected for this year, we have not really revised emerging market growth prospects for 2023. In fact, for some emerging markets, such as South Africa, we actually lowered growth prospects for this year. South Africa, of course, facing its very own structural issues, particularly electricity supply, which has an impact on the outlook for this economy. 
We did, however, wanted to consider an alternative scenario. And the scenario we were looking at to see what would happen to emerging market growth and other factors or variables for emerging markets if the private consumption expenditure in China actually exceeds our baseline outlook we currently have. We assumed quite a stronger rebound in private consumption expenditure under this alternative scenario. So just to give you an example, by the third quarter of this year, we expect quarter-on-quarter annualized growth in private consumption expenditure for China to reach 13% compared to our baseline, which is closer to 6%. That's quarter-on-quarter annualized. And the first thing, our Global Link model, which is a a big model with covering around 95% of global GDP, shows us is that this scenario really triggers a rebound in global oil prices, which goes up by roughly 10 to 15 US dollars compared to the baseline. Now, this increase in global oil prices has got repercussions for inflation, both for developed economies as well as emerging markets, the model shows. It also means that interest rates in developed economies and emerging markets will probably stay higher for longer. But what was very interesting from the scenario run is that the alternative scenario of the increase in private consumption expenditure in China had implications for real effective exchange rates for emerging markets, which were stronger compared to the baseline. There was also a boost in commodity producers' exports, which ultimately fed through to external accounts, which for a lot of emerging markets was stronger than the baseline scenario. I want to mention, however, that the outlook or the alternative scenario for the Brent oil price, which is up between 10 and 15 US dollars, is just based on market dynamics and do not consider geopolitical shocks. So in any instance where there's any geopolitical developments during the coming year under this alternative scenario, which can result in supply chain disruptions for oil, the outlook for oil could actually be much higher under the alternative scenario. So all in all, uh, taking all of these factors in consideration, the Global Link model alternative scenario showed that the region that will benefit the most from a rebound in private consumption expenditure in China above our baseline is the APAC region outside of China. Another region that benefits a little bit from this is Sub-Saharan Africa, where the impact for Latin America is less prominent. And that's due to the fact that the US, which is a major trading partner for the Latin America area, The outlook for the U.S. under this alternative scenario shows less economic resilience and therefore is a drag on the GDP growth prospects despite the rebound in China. And like I mentioned, one of the key features that's standing out under this alternative scenario is the rebound or the improvement in external accounts. And it's not really surprising given the fact that we do assume stronger oil prices under this alternative scenario. Now, the stronger external position is is very good news for emerging markets because it improves its hard currency availability in an environment of limited financial market access due to higher interest rates in developed economy. And it also eases external debt servicing costs obligations, which, of course, has become increasingly problematic for those countries that are facing fiscal constraints and limited access to global financial markets. So with that, I would like to hand off back to you, Sarah. Thank you all for participating and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for listening to the Economics and Country Risk podcast. Connect with us on LinkedIn and Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode.